Hi, this is Dr. Nate Story from Bright Agritech, and this is Aquaponics Academy episode number 13. Today we're going to discuss irrigation, drainage, and sump setups for aquaponic systems. It's a lot of material, but we're going to try and pack it into one podcast, at least the introductory stuff. Welcome to Aquaponics Academy, a bright agrotech podcast designed to help you overcome common aquaponic issues, learn new growing techniques, and help you be as successful as you can be as an aquaponic practitioner. Join aquaponics expert, Dr. Nate Story, the creator of Zip Grow Towers, as he breaks down complex topics into easy to understand information. And now, here's Dr. Nate Story. Today we're going to talk about our design philosophy when it comes to irrigation and drainage. And we're going to discuss the methods, materials, and equipment. Um, So sit tight and uh, prepare to think a lot about pipes, pumps, and sump tanks. Before I get started, I wanted to remind you that reviews are really important um, for expanding the reach of this podcast. And uh, this is mostly just to help uh, experienced aquaponics growers gain more information and insights that they need to be successful and also to help the beginner really get started on the right foot. So if you're listening to this podcast on either iTunes or Stitcher Radio, please do us a favor and leave us a nice review. It will definitely help other people find us and uh, use this useful information. So irrigation, drainage, and sump systems, it's kind of the overlooked part of, of systems. A lot of people think about tanks. A lot of people think about their growing beds or, or basically how they're going to be growing their plants. And they don't really think in too much detail about how they're going to plumb everything together. But just like in the human body, the, the circulation system is so important. Your heart, your blood vessels, everything, moving that oxygen around, keeping you alive. It's the same way in aquaponic systems. Your irrigation and your drainage system is exactly like your circulatory system. It keeps oxygen flowing through your system. It keeps um, all of the healthy nutrients in your system and delivers toxic things and waste to your plants. So it's a valuable uh, way to kind of think about your um, irrigation, your drainage, and your sump system. So it's very important. Think about it in those terms, and uh, you'll probably spend enough time uh, to at least come out with a, with a good system design that's really going to um, benefit your plants and really benefit your fish and your microbes as well. So um, if you've listened to some of our other materials, you know that our design philosophy typically centers around a split flow or a chop design. And uh, these are basically designs where we have um, a sump that's in the ground, and we usually have an inline pump next to it that pulls from the bottom of that sump tank and then splits the flow and sends some of that water to the plants and some of that water to the fish. And everything drains back to that sump tank, meaning it all mixes, and then on the second go-round, if we're turning over our entire system volume twice an hour, at the end of the hour, 75% of the water has been sent to the plants and 75 has been sent to the fish. So it basically allows us to... Um, make sure that the vast majority of our water is being filtered and cleaned by the plants and that filtered and cleaned water is getting to our fish. We love that particular design, even though some folks don't love it and they're entitled to their opinion, Uh, but we love it because it's simple and it allows us to use a single pump to accomplish a lot of work in these systems. So if you haven't um, been exposed to that system design, uh, I would definitely look it up. I'd definitely investigate it. There are other systems out there, including systems that kind of pump and uh, through through these sequential layers of fish and plants, and it gets very complicated, and everything's gravity-fed, so there's not much pressure. And this is a problem. Our second kind of design philosophy is that everything operates better under pressure. If we have enough pressure to blow things out, if we have enough pressure to really introduce fast flows if necessary, that's a good thing. Keeps our fish happy, keeps our plants happy, and allows us to blow out lines. So pressure is an important part of what we think about when we think about um, designing our irrigation and our drainage systems. The last thing to understand is that um, drainage systems and irrigation systems are as much an art as they are a science. Um, If you're doing this on any level below, you know, several million dollars to invest, you're probably engineering the system yourself. You're probably not hiring a a bunch of engineers to crunch the numbers and determine your pipe sizings and determine the correct pump and uh, to do all of that very technical work for you. So you're basically guessing a lot of the time. You're, You're just hoping that you land in the right range. And honestly, if you have doubts, you're probably oversizing things. And that's not always a bad thing, especially when it comes to drainage systems and uh, most of the time when it comes to irrigation systems. So 
It is as much an art as it is a science, especially on a small scale, but there are some rules of thumb that can help us be really successful right off the bat. So um, there's a whole bunch of different methods when it comes to irrigation, drainage, and sump systems. Um, for irrigation, um, a lot of people will use timers. So they will use, you know, their pump will run all the time or, uh, you know, it will run all the time. They'll use like a bell siphon or something to regulate where that water is going. Um, you can use solenoids, computer-operated solenoids, to determine which direction that water is going, where it's going, what it's doing. And a lot of people use timers. So they'll just basically, uh, you know, the water always goes to the same location. The pump just comes on every now and then. Um, the thing to keep in mind with timers, of course, is that pumps do not like hard starts and hard stops, especially if uh, you're using a big inline pump, like a half horse, three quarter horse, something like that with a big old motor to it. It does not like to jerk on and it does not like to turn off suddenly. Um, it can be really, really hard on that motor and you can really, really um, diminish the, the life of that motor. So uh, that's something important to think about um, when you're thinking about your circulation system. You want to make sure that you're leaving that pump on as long as possible if you're dealing with larger pumps with big motors. Um, for irrigation, you know, um, we think about pressure and we think about the kind of pressure we can deliver at every point in the system. And if you over deliver pressure, pressure, you can use regulators like, um, pressure regulating, uh, fittings, or you can use, uh, valves, high tech, low tech, you name it to make sure that, um, you're getting the kind of pressure you want, uh, at your plants or at your fish. And, um, Delivering a little bit of extra pressure is not always a bad thing. Now, I want to say this with the caveat that a lot of people really, really dramatically oversize their pumps. We have, um, we, we set up some indoor hydroponic systems, and then we have other folks that set up indoor hydroponic systems, and they'll be running a three-quarter horse pump or a one-horse pump, and we'll be using a pump that's a tenth of a horse or less. And um, it's all about how you engineer it, how you set it up, but, you know, pressure is a good thing, and a little bit of extra pressure is a good thing. A lot of extra pressure is a bad thing. It means you're spending too much money on your pump, and it means you're probably spending way too much money on electricity to run it. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about your, your, your irrigation. We tend to split our flows, as we say. We um, run it through an inline pump. It's a three-quarter horse pump for our system. It's a 4,000-gallon system. We're running... Um, 350 towers. That pump is still a little bit oversized. We could probably run up to 700 towers on that pump, no problem. And um, we split that flow. We send it through a PVC pipe to our fish. This is hard PVC pipe. And on the other side, we split it and we send it through poly pipe um, to our plants. And um, we send it through one inch mains. So we have three zones that are serviced. Each zone has about 100 towers. Right now, a little over 100, 120 towers or so. And uh, one-inch mains that run down the back of each uh, block of towers. And then we have half-inch risers that come off of that one inch. So the important thing to remember is sizing down is usually not a bad thing, but sizing up is not necessarily. Because what it means is you have higher pressure. Um, well, not necessarily higher pressure, but you definitely have higher flow rates through larger diameter pipes. There's, there's not a cap. Uh, the cap is, is much higher as far as the volumes you can move through larger pipes. So if you're running it through a half-inch pipe and then you size up to a two-inch, um, you have the potential to introduce some pretty weird things to your irrigation system. So sizing down is a good thing. Um, sizing up, not always. Now, I will say sizing down like three sizes, like going from four-inch to one-inch, um, unless you're servicing a relatively small zone, it's not always a great deal. So think about um, what you're doing and make sure if, if there's big changes in the size of the diameter of your pipes, there's a good chance you might be doing something wrong unless you know a lot about the subject of plumbing. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're, as you're plumbing your system together. Anyways, we've got one-inch poly um, pipe that's at the main, and off of those mains, we have half-inch risers, and those risers serve a zone. So each of those risers has a valve on it, and it goes up, and it dumps water into the tops of our towers. Um, we do that using fittings. 
Everyone has fittings, whether you're using hard PVC or poly. Hard PVC, they're usually slip fittings. Um, these are fittings that are designed to be glued um, or screwed together and glued. And um, in hard PVC, you know, they're, they work very well. They're rated for high pressures. They're very durable. They'll last a very long time, but they're pricey. Um, for polytubing, um, our irrigation fittings are mostly barbed fittings or compression fittings. So these are fittings that are basically uh, the compression fittings. The pipe kind of is squished as it goes through this collar. And uh, the, then, of course, when you pressurize the line, it secures the pipe even more so than just compressing the pipe in the first place secures it. Um, barb fittings, of course, are pushed onto the insides of these poly pipes, and we usually end up securing them with um, pipe clamps, stainless steel hose clamps or pipe clamps of some kind. And the reason for that is you'll find um, anyone in a greenhouse that black poly pipe tends to heat up in the sun. That's a great thing for sterilizing lines. You can turn off a zone and, and leave it there for half an hour, and that hot summer sun is going to bake that line and kill everything in it. Um, so that's great for those scenarios. Um, but it's, it's bad because that, as that plastic heats up, it softens. And so if you just are using, uh, if you're just putting it on with pressure and you have really hot sun, really direct exposure, there's a chance that under higher pressures, that line can pop off and, and spray water all over the place. And that has happened to me on a number of occasions. Um, after which I learned to start putting hose clamps on everything. So it took a few disasters to figure that one out. But, um, you know, you learn. You learn uh, the hard way most of the time. So uh, definitely use hose clamps on things that are going to be exposed to the sun, and you'll be really happy with, with poly pipe. Um, barb fittings, we, we punch them through that poly pipe, and they drain right into the tops of the towers. So barb fittings are useful with poly pipe for a lot of different things. And they're not super pricey. So they can be a, a great thing. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I'll talk about this a little bit later, is every time you have an L or a T or a hard angle, you are introducing uh, more and more friction loss. So you'll lose pressure and you'll lose flow at the very end of your line because, uh, of course, as the water travels down that line, there's friction uh, between the water um, coursing through the line and the line itself. And that reduces the efficiency of your system. It means you need to put in a bigger pump or put in bigger lines, and it all ends up costing you. So whenever possible, we just try and curve that poly tubing. We get out a heat gun, and we soften it, and we kind of do a nice, soft turn um, without an L, and that allows us to get a little bit more um, out of our pump and out of our system. When it comes to drainage, um, most of the time, systems are gravity flow drainage. So... 90, I would say 95% of the systems out there, you feed your fish uh, tanks under pressure, you feed your uh, towers or your grow beds or whatever, your rafts even under pressure. Um, and at least in a uh, chop system, then everything after that, you know, after that water is introduced to those subsystems, it's all gravity, uh, gravity flow from then on out. All that water just flows under, uh, you know, the... Uh, under gravity from those high tanks down through your, you know, uh, whether you're doing filtration, anything like that, swirl filters, whatever you have, and drains back to the sump, which is usually in the ground. Um, now, folks who have multiple pumps then typically have some type of assisted return. And um, these are guys who are doing rafts um, sometimes. And um, folks with other types of systems, they have to introduce another pump in there somewhere to either help that water move along. Um, so if you installed your drainage plumbing uh, too small, then sometimes you have to put a little assist in there, a little uh, pump to help keep that water cranking along. Um, similarly, um, if you basically place your, um, if you don't have enough uh, distance, if there's not enough elevation between the point you're draining from and the point you're draining to, and you can't really uh, create a siphon in that pipe, you can't use the, the weight of the water itself to pull water from the top down to the bottom, um, then sometimes you need to assist that flow. Um, we, we avoid any type of assisted flow um, on drainage. We usually just put in a bigger pipe, right? You just put in a big enough pipe, and even if you're moving at a really slow rate, um, you can still move some pretty high volumes. So 
that's something to think about. And, um, of course, if you are using some type of assist to help move water along, you have introduced another point at which your, your system can fail. Right, so you've doubled down on the possibility that you're going to have a have a catastrophic failure or a failure that impacts the the health of your system. So we try to stick to one pump if we can, and um, we try to design around that. And I would, of course, encourage everyone to think along those same lines. We use SLOs, so we pull out of our solids lifting overflows. We pull out of our tanks with SLOs, and um, we drain to settlement tanks, and then um, settlement tanks to the sump. Um, a lot of people use SLOs, and SLOs are really great for a lot of different applications. I highly recommend them, um, especially for fish tanks, because uh, they allow you to drain water from the tank, maintain your water level in the tank, and remove solids. Um, a covered SLO is basically then a siphon, and what you're doing is you're using the weight of the water to, to pull water down through the pipe. Now, the problem with siphons, of course, is that you can drain your tank. So um, if you are using something like a siphon, uh, people use bell siphons in their grow beds to regulate um, kind of the watering schedule. That's great, but be very careful of siphons because once a siphon forms and they can form inside pipes that you didn't expect they would form in, um, they can cause problems. Uh, stand pipes are another drainage tool, and those are just basically a, a pipe that you know sets the water height. So the water flows up over the top of the pipe and then down it. And, of course, um, a standpipe inside of an outer casing with, um, that is much higher than the water level with holes down at the bottom of it, that's all an SLO is. And uh, it gives you the best of both worlds. So there are a lot of different materials that will go into your drainage system. And um, we use hard PVC. We use poly pipe. We use poly tubing, honestly, as much as we can because it's very inexpensive. It's very safe. And uh, like I said, in greenhouses, that black tubing can get really nice and hot, um, which allows us to kind of kill off everything inside it from time to time, which is a useful thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's flexible. It, it allows us to do a lot of things that we just can't do with PVC or things that we would go bankrupt trying to do with PVC. So it's a great tool. Um, definitely use it as much as you can in your system. And they make it in a lot of different sizes. The most common ones are, of course, one inch and smaller, down to half inch or eighth inch or quarter inch even. Um, but, you know, they do make it also in much larger sizes. You just kind of have to go to specialty stores to find the 2-inch or the 4-inch uh, poly tubing. And that's not necessarily the stuff you want, probably want to use anyways. But um, great stuff. We really like it. Um, and, of course, then we use hard PVC uh, when we need pressure or when we need really durable applications, places where people are going to be stepping on things, walking over things. Um, that's where the PVC pipe goes in. And... Um, it's very useful in those applications. For sump tanks, of course, you can use just about any kind of t tank out there, but IBCs are the most popular. And um, we like to set those in the ground, and then you can put all of your other stuff right at ground level, and everything drains nice and easy down to that below ground sump tank. So there's tons of different materials out there. Make yourself familiar with them and uh, get comfortable with them. And, of course, as always, we recommend poly. It's great stuff. The one thing I will say is that more and more people have started using white poly, and um, it's kind of being produced by some of these specialty greenhouse folks, and they like it because it reflects light and this and that. Uh, black poly is still a lot cheaper, and like I said, you know, the nice thing about black poly is it heats up in the sun, and it can kill off um, the algae, it can kill off uh, snails or worms or whatever is kind of accumulating and, and living in those tubes. So... Keep that in mind. Uh, sizing your pipe can be um, can be an issue when you're first starting. So um, the, the, the thing that I always say is start with the diameter that your pump is designed for. So if, if you're putting in a system that requires a half-horse half pump, it probably comes with 2-inch inflow and outflow, right? So let's start with 2-inch inflow. Let's send that up, and then let's split it. And if we split our... Two inch um, outflow from the, um, if we split that two inch coming out of that pump, I'll usually continue with two inch to the fish. So in our system, we continue in with two inch to the fish, and then we split to one and a half inch to each tank. And we're delivering high enough pressures from that pump 
that we don't actually have to size down that pipe very much to get to keep that pressure and that flow really, really good in there. Um, on the other side, we, we split it because the plants are using less water than the fish. We split it down to three one-inch lines. Now, you can do the math on all of this stuff. And um, you can sit there and you, with your calculator and you can go through everything and try and figure it all out. Um, but it ends up getting pretty darn cal uh, complicated. You've got to calculate friction loss. You've got to calculate each turn um, in your pipe. You've got to calculate the run. Uh, the different pressures your pump's delivering with a full skimmer, with a fresh to clean skimmer, um, you know, over the pump life, you know, as it loses efficiency. So typically what we do instead of doing all of that math is um, we kind of just start with the pump we think we'll need and we go from there. And um, sizing your pump to your system can be a tricky task, but, you know, um, most pumps come with just about everything you need. So if you, say, have a 4,000-gallon system and you know that you need to turn over your entire system at least uh, once an hour, say, you know you need a pump with a minimum rating of 4,000 gallons per hour at whatever your highest point is. So if, if your pump's going to be moving that water up 7 feet, then you need a pump with a minimum of 4,000 gallons per hour at 7 feet. That's going to be the minimum, and most likely you're going to need a pump that probably has half, as, half again as much capacity when you calculate in all of the um, demand for your plants, all of the different piping you're going to be running all over the place. And um, so think about um, what, what is the head height on the pump. Head height, of course, is a crucial number to know. That is how high can that, that pump move water. And at different heights, what is the volume that that pump can move? And then, of course, what is the pressure that that pump, pump generates? There are a lot of pumps like... Uh, like diaphragm pumps that will move low volumes at very high pressure. There are traditional pumps that will move high volumes at low pressure. These are like your inline pumps, and then, um, or, or even better, like a submersible pump. And then, you know, some of your inline pumps are a good example of something kind of right in between. It's moving, um, you know, moderate pressures at, at moderate to high volumes. So you got to match the pump to the application, know what you're going to need, and, um, you can go back, you know, if you know you're going to need, say, uh, seven gallons per tower per hour and you've got 100 towers, you know you're going to need 700 gallons delivered to those towers. If your fish volume is 1,000 gallons or 2,000 gallons and you need to turn that over once an hour, you know you need a 2,700-gallon minimum, a pump that moves 2,700 gallons per hour at, um, at your towers and at your fish. And you can kind of do the math and go back from there to figure out which pump is going to be the best pump for you. Um, when you're talking pumps, um, thing to keep in mind is there's, you got, um, typically most people are operating in 110, 120 uh, volt service. So you're going to be using, uh, plugging into a wall outlet, basically a standard wall outlet. Um, a lot of inline pumps come set up to be field wired or they come set up for 220, 240. And, um, that's always great, of course. It's, uh, I tend to like those higher voltages. Um, so if you have that option, definitely keep that in mind when you're shopping for a pump because um, some of those higher voltages can be really nice, um, especially if you're moving up to really big pumps, really powerful pumps. Um, so we've kind of talked about uh, the gamut of materials and kind of the, the basic idea behind um, irrigation and drainage systems. This is a really, really complicated topic. And because it is a very kind of visual topic, it's pretty darn tough to do in a podcast like this. But um, how I'd like for you to think about this is this is just kind of an introductory um, podcast to the subject. And um, hopefully some of the things I've talked about here will serve as great jumping off points to go and do some research, go Google some things, and um, see what you can learn. Um, there's a lot, of, of, uh, a lot of information out there on all of these subjects, so definitely go out there and um, see what you can learn. If you have any questions, of course, always feel free to, to send those questions to us, and we'll do our best to answer them. And... Um, a lot of the time we already have in YouTube videos or in blog posts, that kind of thing. So check out those resources as well. That'll do it for this episode of Aquaponics Academy. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to download the next episode. Um, we're going to be talking about the basics of the nitrogen cycle, which is kind of fun. And um, this is something I'm going to dive into in a bit more detail than, um, than you're probably used to. 
and hopefully it will be nice and free and useful and help you manage your system a lot better. If you're a regular listener, you know that with every Aquaponics Academy episode, we, we help you learn new techniques, overcome common obstacles, and grow your aquaponics or hydroponics system. We also introduce thousands of other listeners to clear, hopefully demystified, and what we think are really valuable resources for the beginner to the advanced grower, everyone along that spectrum, um, which can be found at our website, which is, of course, brightagritech.com. If you do find these podcasts valuable, please consider leaving a tip on our podcast website to help us continue producing these things. And if you're not a Bright Agritech customer yet, we encourage you to check out our incredible product line on zipgrow.com. Uh, it's also uh, linked to brightagrotech.com. So check out um, what we have to offer. It's great stuff. And uh, we'll catch you next time for another episode of Aquaponics Academy. <laughs>